evening everybody oh here we are good evening everybody and welcome to a black cultural archives production i'm nadine drummond and we are joined this evening by the right honorable leroy logan leroy are you there i'm here but what's this right honorable business <laughs> after, after Everybody here, I'm sure, watched Red, White and Blue last night. They are viewing you in a different light. Whatever misapprehensions or misconceptions or miss anything, misappropriations or anything anybody felt about you, I think has changed. And I think there's a level of respect that people have now that perhaps they didn't have because they might not have understood your struggle. And so I had to give you that honor. It's like coming to America. If I had petals to throw, <laughs> I would be throwing them. So, so, so I will them. greet you. I will greet you in my native language, Wakanda forever. Wakanda forever. <laughs> <laughs> so how does it feel? How, how, how does it feel to see your life and and your at that time kind of unique struggle um up on the silver screen because it's silver to us because nobody 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 not in film before before Stephen yeah. Queen. So how does it feel that that your that your story, this this aspect of your life was was used as an example to, to, to show our our liberty in in Britain? Well I, I used to think I was at the cutting edge of um things for years with the Black Police Association and just being a cop in those early days. But this has taken being at the cutting edge of change because Steve McQueen's series and, and using A-lister um, actors like John Boyega is just unique. And especially with this Black Lives Matter movement, I, I and just to be involved in that, just to be mentioned, much less the center of a story that seems to resonate with people. And I just think the timing is so right. You know, the bells are chiming, the alignment is there, and it's just great to be in the autumn of my life and still to be in the mix. I, I couldn't expect any better, and it's beyond my wildest dreams. But you're special though, Leroy, and I think that you might be underestimating that and what your story means generally. And what I particularly liked about Red, White and Blue was that it offered a different narrative, which is about struggle, but the professional struggle, because most of the stories that are made about us focus around um, street life, the road man them, which is part or are part of our broader community. But I think this is the first story when we've seen uh, a guy who has chosen a profession that is frowned upon by his family and his local community. And I think it's really important for people to note that the time when you went to university, a lot of British born blacks, Caribbeans were not going to university at that time because there was a struggle I remember that you had to be put in for your O levels at the time. And a lot of black kids in England at that time were being <laughs> locked out of the O level system. Without O levels, you can do A levels. And without, there were no B techs. Without A levels, you couldn't go to university. So the fact that you were actually able to go to university was a credit in and of itself. So I could kind of understand why uh, Mr. Kenneth Logan, your father, was particularly distressed when, when you decided to join the police force. And so how did you reconcile that relationship? Because it seemed to be a long-term disappointment. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was the biggest challenge of my life because I was going against my hero, my role model. He was a father I had from the first second. He was always in my life until he passed away. So to go against him in any shape or form was a big thing, much less joining the police and be amongst the ranks of those officers who could have beaten him. And also to go away, move against my career aspirations of science, because he really wanted me to go into medicine if, if certain things um, I'd fall in line. So I think that, that was the double whammy. He couldn't understand why I was 
even thinking about the police, much less doing it with the backdrop of him being beaten by the police. And then, of course, all my acquaintances, not my close friends, but my acquaintances were saying, you're a Judas, you're a, host you're a traitor, you're a hostile to the cause. And I say, what cause? Because I was in Jamaica in primary school and I used to see black cops and black doctors and black nurses. So I, I said, well, I, I've seen black cops. So it, what's, the, what's the traitor there? And um, of course, I, I, I knew I didn't have a love for policing because the sus law growing up in the 60s and 70s, and I was a victim of that. I was even stopped in school, in the school grounds. So all these things sort of played against me just saying, yep, yeah, I'm doing it. It was a lot of emotional struggles, a lot of a, a lack, there's a doubt. And, but I just kept on pushing, saying, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. And then obviously Gretel was supportive. My boss at the Royal Free was very supportive. And so that's another thing. I let's just pick unpick that a little bit. Another thing that yep. hit me the second time I watched Red, White and Blue was your non-trauma bonding relationship with your wife. Usually when we see black people on TV, there's some kind of <laughs> madness going on. And you were two people from two slightly different cultures. Your wife is Nigerian and you're Jamaican. And you came together and it was it was love and, and faith that held you. But it was really wonderful when you were trying not to pass your exam and she was helping you. <laughs> what was that like? What kind of support was necessary for you to be able to get through your... Well, it was, it was essential. The 30 years. Yeah, yeah, it was essential. I, I, I'm, I think because Gretel didn't grow up over here, she grew up in Nigeria. And so she came over to settle down in uh, sort of early 20s. Um, so she, she didn't get a sense of, well, police are racist. She didn't know what racism was because she grew up in Nigeria. So she, she didn't um, in any way buy into people's natural perceptions of police are against us, not for us. And as a result of that, she was very, very supportive. And if you take it in all aspects, she was, you know, because we had our first child, Jared, and she had a career in the city of, of London, and she, she, she just really just said, right, I'm here for you. You just have to get on with what you need to get on with and don't fail the exams type thing. And, and then she would drill me. And they were taking it quite lightly in the film, but Gretel was not rampant. Give me that definition or you're not going to bed or you're not going to eat or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and, and I think she just said, right, we know we've got to be twice as good as your white counterparts. So just get this information in your head. and she knew more about legislation than I did. And that was the amazing thing. Um, she'd know the definition of burglary, definition of theft, you name it. And, and, and I thought, wow, <laughs> why are you going to take the exam? And, and, and try, try, try to dress up like me and so they won't notice. But that would have been very <laughs> difficult. But no, but you, I, but you know, just in closing, I, I think it's also the added challenge that bonded us even closer was because in those days, uh, a Jamaican or a Caribbean person or West Indian, as we used to be called ourselves then, and an African person never bonded, you know, because I remember when I brought um, Gretel home, uh, when I met, first met her in, in the late 70s, 76, and my mom said, yes, lovely girl, thank you. This is the one. And my dad said, you can't find a Jamaican girl. And that inertia sort of said, well, well, dad, that's the woman I love. And I'm sorry about that, but that's my choice. And that sort of really gelled us together so that I, I you know, she, she came over hardly any support network. She got it now, all her sisters and, and, and brothers and all, most of them are here. But in those days, it was just the two of us. So we had to really work. So it was, and, it was and like so Miss, there was a, Miss Gretel and Leroy against the world. Something like that. And it was teamwork. It really was teamwork. And we just had to pull together. Um, we couldn't buy into people's perceptions of us, and especially me being in the police service. And and she didn't have a wide network of friends that were going to be saying, susuing and murmuring and say, oh, my, are you, your man is a police. He's thinking of it, or all that sort of stuff. No, no. 
she so she was quite you know comfortable in her own skin and with us as a couple and we just toughed it through and yeah it was just teamwork and you know love and everything that gave us that mutual respect so when was it that that, that your dad accepted accepted your your choice there was an interesting line in the film from the um asian guy uh he spoke urdu so i'd imagine he was i don't know maybe uh pakistani descent and he had yeah. said you know you've got a degree you're a scientific researcher it's like you're a chef and you're leaving to go and do the bins mate what's that about and that was clearly how your father felt so how because you were more educated than everybody you were older than everybody you excelled at hendon and you were still not being promoted at least in the early part of your career which you challenged in the film so how how did you how did you manage that where did that grit come from that fight because that's legendary <laughs> it's legendary not you know, most people I, I, couldn't I, do that I think a lot of people can if they if certain circumstances reveal itself and you think well there's no way uh, no other way out that's the way you got to do it and I, I think there's also a sense of pride I thought right I, I've started this and I will finish because I always said if I can get through the first two years I can get through the other 28 because my report and sergeant when I at my first station as a probationary constable was the worst person you could ever have. In fact, he hated everyone. So it wasn't like he was just didn't like black people. He just didn't like people. So, and he made other people's, other probationary constables' lives absolutely, oh, it's terrible. And and so I said, right, I have to keep going, keep going. And I had to prove my dad, well, not wrong, but to say, listen, just even say though you it. might. Just say it. You had to well, prove it. I, I, I had to show him that there was an alternative way. I think that's the political way of putting it. And 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 as a result of that, um, I thought, well, listen, I, I can't go back to him and say, oh, things are tough, Dad. And um, oh, I didn't get that exam. So I had to make sure I got through the exam. I, I had to dig in deeper because I couldn't go to him and, and say, Dad, like I normally would, oh, the exam didn't go that well. He would have said, what are you expecting me to say? Or what do you want me to do? Who tell if I go there? So I but had to- you know to... what was amazing though? You, in, in a Caribbean context, being invited to drink rum with your parents is a rite of passage. And I thought that was a wonderful closing and that was acceptance in the cultural sense. So was that the first time you drank, or, or when was the first time you drank rum with your dad? Well, Because I my mean... dad, when I go out with my dad, he says to me, it's okay if you have a drink. So yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I, I, I think I, no. I, I think once once uh, I'd left home, you know, and I'd come round, and he would have a little shot, and I'd say, "Oh, well, okay." <laughs> well, I arrived. So yeah, we'd we'd have a little shot now and again. But you know, he, he was really a Guinness man. He used to have the big quart bottle of the Guinness, and I wasn't into that. That thing was too bitter and too it was too large a volume of stuff. So no, he he. he he gave me that validation. I, I think the first time was when he took me to Hendon, because I wasn't. I was going to make my own way, uh, I, you know, because I, I think I, I was going to take public transport. Actually, I know in the film they said uh, someone was going to drop me, but I, I was going to make my own way. And he said, "No, I'll drop you." And I thought, "Wow, that is big," because that was only a few months after him getting beaten up, and just the trauma he would have felt driving into Hendon and seeing all these cops uniforms. I'm thinking, I know, because I said, Dad, are you okay? And he said, yeah, yeah I'm all right, fine. And um, I would just sat there because we were, were early and we we're just talking and he's, you know, he, he made it clear to me that I'm there for you, even though you might not be doing everything I want you to do, but I'm there for you. I'm your father and you're determined to do this, go for it. And I think the second validation was 17 years later, uh, we set up the BPA, we've been involved in McPherson and the Damalola Taylor investigation, and I was getting the MBE. And a lot of people say, why do you take that MBE, man? You know, it's a sellout. I'm glad I did, because I, I dedicated it to my parents. Um, and I said, from the Windrush boat to Buckingham Palace. And Okay, I've got, I've got I, to give you some clicks now. All right, carry on. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me time was up. I thought my time was up. Windrush, never forget. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I and I said, 
you know, and on the, on the, their shoulders of our forefathers and foremothers, the wider village, they allowed us to be able to stand in corridors of power. And whether you like the queen or not, she's a corridor of power. So taking them there, and I remember just before we were splitting, for me to go into the area where recipients get their um, briefing and the guests go for uh, champagne and canopies and all that, he just said to me, well, I think you did the best thing after all. You made the right choice. And I, that validation was so heartfelt. I mean, all of the concerns and torments just disappeared. And it was so important because within two years, both my mother and father passed away. So I'm glad I accepted the MBE because it was for them. And in a lot of ways, I, I think it made my my relationship with my, my, my father even stronger, even for those last two years. It, I was always strong with mum. She was always understanding. But dad, he put aside so many things. And and I must admit, the the, the need for a sequel is there because I know they were budding up with a drink, but I would just love them to sort of come together. It, it, it really would really make me warm inside. It, it's, it's making me warm inside. And I think what's also uh, was struck striking in the film as well is that your best friend is still, was, is uh, Lee John. And there's a part in the film where he says, you know, you know, Leroy wanted to join the band and you said, no, no, no. Or John Boyega said, no, 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 I didn't. And you're a trumpeter by, by, by musical trade. So was that actually true? Were you good enough to join Lee John's band? Oh, of course. If I wanted to, <laughs> I'll tell you one of the main reasons why I couldn't join the band, because I was studying. So when imagination and everything was going, I was doing my, um, well, in the lead up to, to imagination, he was in the showbiz. So I was doing my A-levels, I was doing my degree. And then I was going, I went straight from finishing my degree, straight into work at the Royal Free. So I'm always studying, whereas he was all over the place and everything. But I must admit, I, I did have the opportunity to be socialising with the band. And a lot of people assumed that there was four members of the band, not three. So I just walked in with them because I was always with Lee, even long before Imagination, driving him to his auditions and various other things, you know, gigs. So a lot of people just saw me as, you know, part of the family, part of the group. And um, yeah, but everyone said, did you want to be? I mean, if, if, if the circumstances were different, possibly, but I love playing the trumpet. And it's only policing that stopped me from playing, continuing. And um, I, 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 I think our friendship is stood the test of time because we've had separate lives. He's doing his imagination thing. I applaud him. I'll go in there, you know, Whoopie doo, well, click, click, click. What support, what, what support did he offer you though? Because you remain scandal free, even though they try to scandalize you. Uh, and the reference audience is to an 80 pound hotel bill mm -hmm. that they said that Leroy would try to teak for defraud or something like that. And Leroy has successfully won quite a hefty settlement in court. Um, so going through those sorts of trials, you kept your circle tight and it seems as if Lee John was one of those people. So what kind of support had Lee John been able to offer throughout throughout your career because your relationship spans decades? Well, it's really tough for Lee because I know when I first told him, he was in a dilemma because he, he knew um, that other people were not going to accept it. So he, he's now got this situation where he's trying to manage like two factions, you know, for Leroy and against Leroy. Most of the people were against me. So he had to try and manage that. And as well, his budding career, which was launching itself astronomically, literally. And he was trying to say, well, listen, I'm for you, but it's gonna be a tough one. And, and, and I think um, the time when I saw him was life-saving, literally, was when I was at Hendon and the, the, I couldn't eat the food, the culture, it was racism, it, you know, the N word, the W word, the P word, it's rife. It, people just talked, you know, if you, in the name of um, staying in the job, if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. And everyone's just laughing at you, whether it's color of your skin, your accent, whatever. So I I'd have to dip out of that, um, especially 
when Lee bought his house literally around the corner of Hendon, it was five minutes walk. So I would dash from there after the classes. If he was around, I'd dash in his house, eat some soul food, drink some champagne, do some dancing just to get myself grounded back in my culture because otherwise I, I, I don't know how I would have survived because it was really crazy. And then I think the other thing is, it was in the film, the when he went when John goes into Hendon uh, for the first time and he's hearing the music from the other room, and and that's actually well, my, my colleague Tom P Tom Kelly even he he didn't have the the big soul music but he was playing some music I could relate to and I thought wow this is quite quite interesting I wasn't expecting that and um, it, I think it was like Northern Soul or something like that I can't remember exactly and it, and then I realised it was a Sandhurst instructor he was really um, well, such a leader. And we, we had adjoining rooms and, you know, we'd always be exchanging notes on studying. So he grounded me. He taught me how to iron my trousers properly, you know, with a cloth, not like in the film. You didn't see it, you know, don't put the iron straight on the cloth. You have to put your, you know, you put the iron after the cloth. Anyway, all those little tricks, bullying up your shoes, the lot. So I looked good because Tom tutored me. So that tutoring, and, and again, not in the real culture. And we were older as well. He was a bit older than me. So with us old fuddy daddies were, he was class captain, I was his deputy, and, and that helped me. And then there was Lee. When I got a chance to just get out that culture, he would go, you know, I would go, listen, you got some food for me? You got some champagne? You know, put on the records. And just, you know, I mean, he really got me through Hendon in such a remarkable way. And that in itself was such, um, well, it was in invaluable. And and then he, and, and throughout my career, he, he was there, because remember, he was best man at wedding, godfather to my son, and he was always there. And his mum um, became my mum, especially after my parents passed away. You know, I, I call his mum, Jesse, mum now, because she's, and we say we're brothers from another mother, um, even though I've adopted Jesse more than him. But so he's been there the whole time. And I can't think of anything more poetic than he's part of the film as well. In fact, <laughs> I sometimes think to myself, is this film about you or me? I, I, I'm not too sure. But no, he, he, well, he's, what, been, he's been good. He's been really good. What's your superpower, Leroy? Well, my superpower is not to give up. You know, my, my superpower is just to listen. Do not let anyone tell you you can't do it. I, I, I've realized that I've got so many faults, but I'm working on them. And I, re and I think that's one of my superpowers. I recognize my faults. I, I, I try in every way I can to improve on them. But I, I, I just cannot, cannot let other people from derailing me for what I want to do. And, and I instill that in my children and my grandchildren. I think it's the worst thing when someone defines you by their perceptions and their attitudes to you because of the color of your skin or your gender or your faith or whatever it may be. And I, I, that for me is infuriating. And, and for me, it's just to recognize that. And, and I suppose in a lot of ways, um, my faith has it, been really um, such a strength for me because I know, uh, especially when we set up the Black Peace Association, it was clear to me that my faith was not um, here today, gone tomorrow. It, it had a practical sense. So when you're working with chief constables, the commissioner, and all their leadership teams, as well as politicians, etc., you need to know your stuff, and you can't ramp around. You've got to be in there speaking truth to power. They might not like it, but you have to show you know your um, profession very well. So um, I, 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 I think that's got to know your stuff and know your faults, your areas, and never give up. So resilience, we could say resilience is your super. Is that power. what I just said? Okay, resilience. <laughs> I think I think resilience is resilience because you have to stand firm. You have to stand because you're in the fire. You have to stand firm. So another question I wanted to ask you was. In, in the film, we see a scene which 
was really emotionally uncomfortable where the two overtly uh, racist police officers had used excessive force to arrest or detain or throw a black guy in the cell and you walk away and you firm up yourself, your superpower kicks in, your resilience, and you challenge them and then you go to see if the guy's all right and he 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 lets rip on you, calling you all of those names and in the film it looked like in a, a really what it was it was it was it was an emotional emotionally uh, stressful time how how did that make you feel it's a different thing when when white people or others call us names because you know we develop a skip, thicker skin against all of these sorts of aggressions but when when black people your own people people from your own communities who you know are being mistreated by the police blame you they, they take out their their pain because it's pain they take out their pain on you how where did you put that where did that go how, how did you deal with that well a lot of it was around um talking to my nearest and dearest um i i wouldn't discuss a lot of these things with gretel because i didn't want to distress her but i, I would have um people who you know like lee people who were versed in adversity let's say because lee in in, in um, the music field he had a lot of adversity and people trying to hold him back but a lot of it i just had to just resolve in myself and and really you know pray on it and and um just you know other practitioners outside the police you know social workers people that i'd be working with and say wow you know i just had such a hard time you know and then you know people were shared and common experience to myself but a lot of the times you know especially if it's there and then i'll just suck it up and say right you know i don't blame that person i know that if i was in a similar position i've just been beaten up by white guys you know police officer or not you turning up trying to be nice to me and you wear the same uniform because in those days and similar to, to, to today which is really sad the the, the protector and the pre predator wear the same uniform and that for me is the real sad thing that so but many people but, but well under leroy you used to wear the uniform so weren't you a predator too I suppose in in that guy's eyes, oh, you know, or anyone who, who even when I was a custody sergeant, they, they see me booking them in and, they, you know, what is going on here? But it's how you treat people as well, because even I had a situation where someone, you know, you know I, I'm trying to deal with them in the cell and they're shouting at me and, and so forth. But I'm going to see. Well, listen, I know that if I was in a similar position, I might be reacting in a certain way and and I can understand it. And I want to show you that I'm treating you as a human being. And I will not relent on that. I'm not going to buy into, you know, violence. Because I one thing, I'm, I wasn't brought up that way. And I wasn't going to revert to that. If I, I was trained to use um, certain holding tactics to restrain people. But I wasn't going to do that liberally for no reason as far as i'm concerned only as the last resort so let's but, stick up in for a second so what you're saying is mm. you're the consummate professional and you come from it from a humanitarian perspective and i respect that but if we can just segue into the book now so everybody if you don't know leroy has published a book a memoir of of his life as as a police officer which is available is it available on audible at the moment leroy not yet but hopefully not yet um, early next year early next year early next year hopefully it'll be on audible but you can buy it on Amazon now. Yeah. And in in the book, there wasn't really an instance of any time that you felt compromised. And that's I found that really interesting, particularly in the film, because there were times when you were calling for backup and it was looking like someone was trying to kill you. You get liquid pipe kicking at your belly and nobody came and you had the same um Asian guy, South Asian guy, driving from across whichever part of West London coming to try and save you. But by that time, you saved yourself. And so I wondered what the types of compromises, if any, you did make, because you there were clearly some issues with the way that uh, some officers were dealing with with black, uh, what do you call them, arrestees, black 
people brought into the police station the suspect, and then yeah. black suspects and then you still needed to rely on these people that didn't even really to want you there in the first place so that was such a tightrope and i just thought wow that must be so hard so like how much did you have to compromise in in order to ensure you had protection from your team who looked like they were going to leave you to dead and also um still maintain your values well I you know, my dad used to say, you've got to be a lone wolf in time. Uh, you've got to be, certain times, you've got to walk on your own. And, and I found, especially my first station, maybe if, uh, if I was stationed at somewhere else, whether it, you know, but I, it was my home station where I grew up in Islington. So I knew the area, I knew the people. So I didn't have to rely on officers, you know, to um, ingratiate myself on anyone. Because I, I made it clear from before I started, I'm a black man who happens to be a cop. And I'm, here I'm in retirement, I'm a black man. So I didn't have to um, integrate, in a, in a, assimilate rather, assimilate in a way that I lose my beliefs and values and adopt the norms and, uh, norms and values of the culture. And, and that's a total difference from me integrating as a black man with my beliefs and my values and sticking to that. So, but the, the, the real challenge was, they used to see me as a person to suspect. Uh, they used to say, you know, why 26, by, by, you know, late 20s, you, you've got a science background. Why are you joining the organisation? Are, are you a bit of a plant, a journalist? Are you, you write a book? Uh, well, they were right. I wrote it about 37 <laughs> years later. But that's how they used to feel. And because uh, I didn't fit the mould. And I, and I used to get results because I knew the area, I knew... You know, and, and, and what lies um, with that lack of backup? I remember, um, for those of you who know Penteville Prison, behind there's a road called a Roman Way. And I, I, I had an arrest of two guys who had been stealing car parts all over the, the, the top end of the ground of Islington. And I remember um, catching them. And one, I, I walked right up to him. He didn't, because I took my helmet off. And I was just in that, we used to have those dark um, raincoats. We didn't have the reflected jackets like you have now. So I literally walked up to him and he didn't realize I was a police officer until he saw the silver numbers. And he thought, oh my God, the old bill. And, <laughs> and it was too late. And then his mate came around and we, and we sort of looked at each other. And I'm thinking, are they going to kick off now? By this time, I've already asked for backup, but no one's coming. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't have a go. Um, now I was pretty fit, so they would have had their hands full anyway, and they didn't look like they were youngsters. You know, they, they were they weren't as as young as myself. But I knew I had to show but them. But Leroy, you see, this is the thing. Like I couldn't imagine that you go to work, right, and you call for and they don't come and so you're on the road you're on your ends i get that but you're fighting crime criminals on a daily basis where sometimes they employ violence as a way of escape and you're literally on your ends on your own and you don't know if you could dead if you might not recover from the lick you get that day and no one's coming well That's yeah and and, and and i must admit I, I did say to them you know i wasn't as how can i say impassioned as um, John, because he was really upset. He was not even vexed, he was vexed. So I never showed myself to be vexed in that way. But I just told him, listen, this act, this works two ways, you know. If, 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 if Whenever you're in court, I just hope I'm there to help you. And, and I used to put it like, kill them with kindness type thing. You know, all right, fair enough. But, you know, I still got results and I still wasn't going to ingratiate myself on them. So... It, 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 um, I wasn't going to weaponize their attitude on me. In fact, I were turned it around to say, listen, even though you didn't back me up, I'm still going to get my results. I'm still going to be showing my worth because I haven't got time to waste. I've got to really push on because I want to do the best I can, not only for myself, but my, for my community. Because I want them to show, I want to be a role model. I want, I want people to say, well, actually, he, he's doing well. Not necessarily just rising up the ranks, but having a position of influence. And I used to go into colleges and, and, and various um, schools to just show my worth and tell them that it's a great job. And, you know, but I used to say to them, it's a tough one. And 
a lot of it is tough because of the people you have to work with. But fortunately, I was able to take care of myself. I was I was very fortunate that if I can talk myself into a problem, I can talk myself out of it. And and that's why but I was Leroy, quick, hmm? wasn't wasn't that lonely though, even though you chose to traverse this path, you 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 your neck was on the block when you were at work. You couldn't always rely on your colleagues, especially in the early part of your career. You had your family, you had young kids, you had aging parents. Uh, how the sacrifices that you made for your career, in part for your community, must have, or did it, I shouldn't say must, did it leave you wanting in any way? Yeah, many times I, I felt, why am I doing this? Because at those early stages, the first 10, 11 years, I, I couldn't really see what is what is the benefit. All right, at 88, I, sorry, in 1988, five years after I joined, I was promoted to sergeant. Uh, and it's during that time, I could see my leadership having a benefit and, and having a bit more, um, you know, opportunities to do my own thing, as it were, with my team. As long as we're getting results and we're keeping the streets safe and helping people and mm -hmm. solving problems, etc. But I, 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 I knew that it would work itself out if I just be determined to do that. And I know a lot of people think that, you, you know, you, you were crazy. I thought it was crazy. I thought there was something wrong with me. Why would I want to do this to myself? I had take myself out my comfort zone into the one most hostile environments, this macho driven testosterone culture. And I was then giving myself this sense of isolation. But instead of um, feeling weaker, I was feeling stronger. I, I was feeling, I've got this. And I don't, I didn't have any doubt. And it's, it's but even there, the but, same. But, but, but there were consequences for that too, though, because in the book, it also, or you also share the time when, when your your wife, uh, Miss Gretel, she she left you, and that that was must have been a lick. Because... Oh yeah, yeah, it was. It was massive, massive. I mean, you know, you have your fusses and fights, and from time to time she'd go around her sister and stay a couple of days, and right, you know, we'll have. Leroy, she left you. No, I know she left. No, I know. She I'm not trying. She left that's, you. That's why. That's why it fooled me. Because after a couple of days, I'm thinking, she's not coming back. So I called her up. She didn't answer my calls. I, asked, I called her sister. Is she there? Yeah, but she's not speaking to you. And she had taken Miles, our youngest. He was only just under a year old when, when it, she, she left. And um, I thought, oh, you know, it was leading up to Christmas of, of, of 93. And um, I thought she'd be back for Christmas. Well, Christmas came and went. <laughs> In fact, we shared Christmas at my parents' house. She wouldn't come back to the house. I thought, well, what is this? She said, no, unless you get your priorities right and bring God back in our relationship, that's it. Forget it. And, um, yeah, she, she, she taught me a lesson of priorities. Your first ministry is your family. Get that right and everything else will fix itself. So as a result of that, I learned serious lessons about, okay, you can have a very, very consuming sort of profession but you still need to give the appropriate time and space and quality time to your family and not just be the breadwinner and just pay the bills and all that sort of stuff. Because she had a career herself. So it wasn't like she just totally dependent on me. She was alongside me, you know, setting the, uh, our, our way forward, charting our way forward as a team. And she didn't have to, you know, uh, acquiesce and, uh, and be subservient. So she, she was a strong person who made it clear that this was, it, it was the shape up or ship out. And I shaped up, I think. No, I did. I did. But no, here we are 37 years later. But that's still, it's still, it's still commendable. And I think it's also testament to your character, which is that it would appear at least through uh, viewing of the film because it's clearly through Steve McQueen and 
Courtier Newland's eyes. And I failed or neglected to mention earlier that Courtier wasn't able to join us. And I didn't want that to distract you because we had the wonderful Leroy Logan to take up all of the time. But um, Courtier sends his regards oh, 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 no and, and apologies. Please, don't, don't boo, don't boo, don't boo. Please, don't boo. Uh, I, 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 well, I, I know Courtier is better looking, but you just have to put up with me. <laughs> no, you're fine, you're fine. You can hold your own, mate. You can hold your own. Yeah. So I just I think that it, it speaks to uh, you primarily. I think uh, it would appear that you're a man of service, whether you're servicing your local community through a uh, police force, and you also have your organisation called Void Youth, and then you have your ministry as well, which is your faith, but also your family through your faith. But what we haven't heard about is is your service through voyage ministry that happened a bit later on in your career but you mention it in the book as well so how how does voyage voyage minute um i keep saying voyage it's not void ministry it's voyage voyage right it's just straight voyage, voyage, youth, right? voyage, so, youth, voyage, youth, voyage youth and so how how does voyage youth play into you how is that a manifestation of you because we understand you as a police officer and your motivations we understand your motivations around your family and your faith where do your motivations come you're one minute you're locking up the youth them and maybe them go going to prison and then now you're trying to save them on the what like how how does that work i used to pride myself as having the lowest arrest rate of people generally i i mean i, I wanted to make sure i had a hundred percent arrest rate of the criminal them I didn't want to be arresting people on the margins. I want to be dealing with the ones who are really orchestrating that. So I had a really um, close focus on young people. Um, when, when I was a sergeant in Edmonton, we set up the Volunteer Cadet Corps, and it was only the second one across the Met at the time in, in, in 89. And it was the same uh, time um, Princess Diana came to see us and she wanted to see the Cadet Corps and, you know, that, that um, iconic picture with her still, um, well, pride of place in my, my living room here. And so I had a focus on young people. And, and of course, when we heard about the, the death of Stephen Lawrence, and that was actually the same month of, of uh, we had our founder member meeting of the Black Police Association, and our lives ran parallel. And then my involvement in the Damalola Taylor investigation, uh, it started to show to me and other members of the, of the BPA, that we needed to be explicitly serving the needs of our community. Because even in those late 90s, early O's, knife crime was starting to sh show its, its, its very, very worrying trends. And we realized it, education was the key. And we wanted to share our experiences in a structured way. And that leadership program we started in 2001 we started the concept in 2000, but started to deliver it in, in 2001 till this very day, uh, as stood the test of time because it's culturally competent based on operational sound um, experiences so that young people know their rights and responsibilities, whether it's a stop and search or any other encounter with um, police. And they hopefully will engage in that contact in a positive way and this also helps police officers because we used to bring in officers to say well listen this is what young people are saying about you and what is the best way that you would deal with that so it's a two-way process and also develop positive peer-to-peer -peer mentoring because we knew that there's too much negative peer pressure so we wanted to let young people know choose your friends wisely know your rights and responsibilities and know that you can change your environment and not become uh, a victim of it and and so for how, me how many how many young people have, have have passed through your hands then through your program voyage um well each year we have at, at least a hundred cohorts so you're at least two thousand uh, young people who have gone through our books we would love to be wider because of course the the, the um finances are, are, are restricted that for us to expand but since black Lives matters our um finances is the best it's been because i think a lot of corporate organizations because we used to have public funding but that's dried up so corporate um social responsibility of organizations has really increased they not only give of finances but their time they devote mentors 
and you know giving us um such stability that we, we we're in a better shape we thought when covid hit we would be in bad shape but it, we've gone from strength to strength and that's why i've been pleased to hand over the baton uh to uh, a young really competent young man andrew flarty he's a young black man in the city of london doing amazing work and he's taken on the baton as being chair i'm now in the um the, the patron zone and um of, of course voyage is still my first first love it's the jewel in the crown of my career because there is that legacy that's continued after my retirement and and i feel that we've had some excellent um people have gone through you know we, we met them with it in year nine 14 15 year olds and now they're in their late 30s and, and it's quite remarkable going on that journey with them and being accessible so that they when they need us we respond and that's i think that's the thing that really helps it it's a structured btec level two working closely with the schools and the family but it's also we allow ourselves to be accessible so they can obviously have a lot to do um, or we can help them on their day-to-day -day issues. That that's wonderful that you're able to to cope, help them cope with with social circumstances and perhaps even social conditioning. So, in terms of your plans for the future, what's next? Because you, it seems like now your world is going to reblossom once people have a greater understanding of the many layers and the depth to uh, Leroy Logan MBE, former Inspector Judas. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, so, so that, that was a reference to the film as well. If you've watched yeah, it, yeah. where Leroy yeah. was walking with 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 another constable, and the guys were calling names, and they said Judas. And what did you say, Leroy? I'm Officer Judas to you. <laughs> See there. All right. So, 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 tell our wonderful Black Cultural Cultural um, Archives audience what's next, because I think people will be interested in your story going forward and perhaps trying to figure out how they can help support Indigenous-led community organisations that are really trying to help uh, all young men, but particularly young Black men, overcome some of the challenges uh, being born and raised in uh, inner cities. Okay, before I, 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 I talk about what my plans are for the future, I, I just want to name check uh, a young man. It was not that, not that young now. Uh, his name is Paul Anderson. I don't know if he's watching, but um, he's the CEO of Voyage. And, and, and that character who in the film says, Officer Ju uh, you're a Judas, is based on Paul. Because when I was a probationary constable, Paul was one of my worst nightmares he was terrible he would sit on the corner of holloway road and phil crescent for those of you know it and there's a library there and they were just cut there on the other side of the road where there's a park and st mary the magdalene park and they would be calling me names and they'd be, be waiting for me you know because they they must have known what my shifts were because they'd be waiting for it all the time anyway um i i, I used to turn it around as banter Officer Judas, how do you know my name was coconut? How do you know that's my best food? I love coconut, how do you know? And all that sort of stuff. And uh, it would really upset them. So it turned into banter, because I think they wanted me to run after them and all that. And I said, I don't get my, I don't get my uniform dirty. I don't, don't run for anyone. I keep that on a football or other sporting events, because I used to run for the Met with hurdles and all that. And, um, and that turned around because years later, when um, Paul was, you know, um, settle himself down. He, he went and set up the UK Centre for Carnival Arts and he, he caught, contacted me and got me to be one of his trustees. So um, that we were working on that for a few years and then um, Voyage was um, then in dire straits and I thought, well, listen, um, Paul, you've got to come and work with me on Voyage. And, and we, we both that started to work very heavily on Voyage. So, that I just wanted to name chat Paul because we are working together now. And and in all honesty, you know, if I'd arrested him, he, he, well, he would, I don't think he would have called me to say, well, listen, um, you know, you made my life absolute hell. So here we are. And so it just says how you deal with people. Maybe 30, 40 years later, it has real fruits. And and I don't know, Voyage has gone from strength to strength because of Paul. So I just want to name check him. Um, in terms of ways forward, um, I know the issues around um, education is really, really key. So 
um, from the film, I'm working with BBC um, Learning and their department has come up with a, a cartoon uh, of myself and uh, it's with snippets of the film. So going back to the schools, I want to go into primary schools. So I, I, with Voyage, we've been in secondary schools, but I want to go, go into um, primary schools and um, that teaching, teaching package will work with, with the staff. So that's the first thing. Um, and of course, um, I, I, I want to see, before, any, before anything, I want to see a sequel of Red, White and Blue. And, and I know a lot of people are saying, the thing finished too early, but we wanted to keep you waiting and wanting and desperate to see the next film. So we're um, working on that. The other thing that's really important um, is how policing has had a massive impact on um, young people, especially being, being stopped and searched and handcuffed on top of that for no reason, because I've seen them using handcuffs on a on pregnant a woman and, 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 and women who serve, uh, face, are creating no risk and you're putting handcuffs on them, why? Um, and then that really draconian enforcement tactics has to change. But I think the only way to do that is to show the trauma it's having, you know, what that impact of that action is. So I, I'm working with um, two um, professors. Um, um, one is Coral Dando and Jay McKenzie, and, and they're really amazing um, academics who've got a real calling for this piece of work. And uh, I know that we can start to assess this very properly as, because even Coral, she's an ex-police officer and she's now uh, one of the most eminent professors in this field, to really assess the impact of trauma. So we're asking people who, you might know someone who's got a video or some sort of footage, audio, whatever, whether you've complained or not. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be a parallel for the Independent Office for Police Conduct. I am not in any way saying, I am gonna solve your crimes. All I'm saying is, or you, what you feel is a crime against you by, by the police, and I can identify with that, but I'm not here to solve that. Um, I'm saying if you send in your videos or your bits of footage and we can assess it, and it might be that we do some follow-up with you and look at this issue very closely, we can get some qualitative assessment of impact on that, those individuals to say, listen, this is what you're causing. Because I know there are various adverse childhood experiences that people suffer from, whether it's in the home or on the streets. And part of that on the streets is where officers impact them on a daily basis. And, and I, I truly believe that will help the police service to know the importance of trauma-informed policing. So you don't disrespect people, you treat them with, with dignity and, and, and understand what is the impact if you treat them in an unprofessional way and a very aggressive way? So that's that's the thing that we're we're looking to start in the early um, part of first quarter of next year. So please, if you believe that this is something that you can communicate to us, um, we have. So where can, my, where can where can people go, Nero? Where can they yeah. find more information about this new project of yours? Yeah, yeah. If you go onto my website, LL my initials at LeroyLogan.com. So you, you, you'll you see the information um, there to help you to, to know what we're trying to do with those lived experiences of stop and search. And as I said, let me emphasize, I am not um, being an advocate on this one. I'm being an academic, okay? I would normally be solve, trying to solve people's issues as an av uh, advocate or as an activist. Um, I'm, st I'm still doing that role, but on this specific project, I'm acting as an academic with my colleagues um, from, you know, uh, eminent colleagues who, who know these issues. So please, th th this for me is part of the sequel, you know, the sequel, okay, we're doing that, but this is part of the sequel. And I, I really want um, us to do, I think, the really important work 
because well, it's, the granu- my- it's the granular work isn't it it's the work mm. that is the work that allows once you get the data the granular data then you can show impact and then you can use that as a way to uh, affect changes and you're clearly somebody that that has been in the system for a long time and you know how it's work and how it works and you know it's needed so on that note uh Leroy we have to close because we have a limited wow. amount of time. I know it's oh, been wow. it's been fun, <laughs> hasn't it? Honestly, so honestly, I, I, I just I just really want to thank you for taking the time to come and share yourself, your whole authentic self with the back black cultural archive audience and we hope that once you have your academic project up and running, you might be willing to come back and speak with us again. Absolutely. I, I, and and that's the thing. I just wanted to say it publicly and, and if anyone knows any youngsters, especially if they've been stopped and searched on a regular basis, you know, uh, driving a car or just walking on the street or with their friends, please encourage them to send in their videos. And let, let's really look at this as a people. Because, you know, in closing, my mother and my father used to say, who feels it knows it. We feel it. We know it. We're going to do something about it. Indeed. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for registering. Thank you for coming to hear uh, the man behind the story, Red, Right and Blue, Lee Logan. You can also watch the series which was released on Amazon Prime if you've missed it. And you can get to know more in-depth knowledge about all of the things Leroy didn't share here in his book. Would you like oh, to remind can, can us about say, the title of your book? The, oh, can you see my friend here? <laughs> it's called... <laughs> <laughs> Closing ranks, my life as a cop, and um, it. The film is great. Trust me, it is phenomenal. I'm so proud of it. John has done an excellent job. Antonia Francis, she plays Gretel so well. Steve McQueen, oh, he's an icon. And the cast and crew, um, Tracy Schofield, executive producer, phenomenal person. But it's still the starter. The main course is the book. Trust and me. There no. you have it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Leroy. Thank you, the audience. And thank you to our producer, Juanita, who has put this together, who's running everything uh, behind, behind the scenes. Uh, the girl with the red glasses. We'll speak to you all Very soon. close to me. Juanita Wakanda. What Forever. a manager. What a manager. <laughs>